Hey folks, Tuba Dillon here. While I was at IET, I got a chance to interview Colonel Michael Colburn, former director of the president's own United States Marine Band. He's now the director of bands at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana. And without further ado, I'm going to bring you that interview right now. So please remember to subscribe to this channel. I'm going to put out new videos, uh, hopefully more often in the coming weeks and months, especially my IET or International Euphonium and Tuba Festival videos. And uh, subscribe and click like if you like these videos or if you don't, say don't like, don't like, but really I hope you like it. So here is the interview with Michael Colburn. I hope you enjoy it. Well, let's first tell me, uh, tell me your name and give me a little bit of history about yourself, starting with maybe your first memory of when you really decided you wanted to do music, or uh, either as for the love of it or as a career when you were young. Okay, well, I, you know, on that question alone, I could probably talk for half an hour, but, uh, so uh, my name is Michael Colburn. My uh, musical uh, uh, life really began um, with my earliest memories as a toddler, uh, sneaking into my brother's bedroom. He was a tuba player, and he had a sousaphone that he kept in his bedroom. So I would sneak in there, I was maybe three or four at the time, and crawl up inside the sousaphone, get close enough to the mouthpiece to buzz into it and make this huge sound, which I just found you know, incredibly empowering, right? And so I wanted to play tuba. That is, as far back as I can remember, I wanted to play tuba. And so when it uh, came time to choose an instrument in fifth grade, um, I wanted to play tuba, but my father, who was a high school band director, encouraged me to start on the baritone horn. He said, it's very much like a small tuba, and when you get bigger, you can switch to the tuba. I always wondered if he had an ulterior motive because he never had enough euphonium players, but he's never really confessed to that anyway. But I started out on the baritone. I uh, was very fortunate in that my uh, first band director was actually a bass drum player. He was a low brass guy. So he got me started on private lessons on, on the baritone. And then when I got to junior high, I did try tuba and trombone. And I enjoyed those, but there was something about the baritone that I just uh, fell in love with. You know, I think it was you know, the sound of the instrument, but it also it was the uniqueness of the euphonium, the fact that a lot of people didn't know what it was, you know, and had to kind of explain that to people that I, I found kind of intriguing. So, um, so I started high school, uh, you know, as a, as a baritone player, uh, eventually got a, a Yamaha euphonium, I made the big jump there. Um, my first exposure to a professional euphonium player happened um, when I was in eighth grade. It was at a summer brass camp at the University of Vermont. Uh, I'm from Vermont originally. And um, one of the clinicians was a gentleman by the name of Lucas Spiros, who was the principal euphonium in the United States Marine Band. And that was my first exposure to a professional euphonium player, to one of these beautiful silver four valve compensating euphoniums. You know, I had this little con bell front baritone horn at the time and felt very much like, you know, I, I was in over my head. But uh, Luke was an incredible gentleman, so generous, very kind. Uh, even though I had this dinky little baritone, he was very complimentary about my playing. And, and uh, that was really where the seed was planted that maybe I could actually play euphonium for a living. You know, before that, I just had no idea that was even a possibility. So um, as I made my way through high school, I had several interests. You know, I loved playing basketball. I was very interested in history. You know, I had um, a, a number of passions. But as I made my way through high school, music really kind of emerged as the thing that I, I just loved to do. And I was pretty good at it. You know, I wouldn't say I, I've, I've never thought I had any kind of natural talent for anything really, but music was something that I seemed to be able to do pretty well and got some positive attention for, you know. And so gradually I started thinking, yeah, I think I want to go into music. Um, so I went to the uh, Crane School of Music in Potsdam, New York. It's part of the uh, SUNY system, the state university system in New York, uh, as a music education major. Even though what I really wanted to do was play my euphonium for a living, my father very wisely you know, counseled me to uh, go the music education route just because the chances of landing a professional you know, performing position are, are pretty limited. And my uh, tuba euphonium professor at, at Crane, uh, Peter Popiel, encouraged me to do the same thing. But um, when I started at Crane as a music ed major, I found that I didn't have as much time to practice my euphonium as I really hoped for. My music education courses were really demanding. It was a great program. I mean, the, the music ed program at Crane is fantastic, but, but really pretty demanding. And I just found that you know, I, wasn't being able to, I wasn't able to practice the euphonium as much as I thought I needed to to really land one of these jobs. 
And I had friends who encouraged me just to blow off my music ed courses and spend more time practicing, but I, I'm, I've always been a pretty serious student, and I didn't feel right about not taking those music ed courses seriously. So at the end of my freshman year, I decided to change my major to performance without telling my parents, which I find really embarrassing to confess to, you know, even to this day. But uh, I got a couple of months into my second year at Crane and um, my conscience really got the, the better of me. And I called my father up and said, look, I've got to tell you this, you know, and he was actually very understanding. And my point to him was that I didn't want to be 30 years old looking at myself in the mirror wondering you know, what might have happened if I just spent a little more time practicing. And I really wanted to pursue this performance thing, performance thing to the best of my ability. And he actually you know, heard me out and said, you know, you've clearly given this a lot of thought. And, and my promise to him was, you know, I will give this a certain amount of time. And if I don't land a job, I promise you I'll go back, I'll get certified, and I'll be the most dedicated band director you've ever met. And he thought that was a pretty reasonable deal. And so uh, I started looking around for another school because uh, Crane was primarily a music ed school. And I felt like I needed to be at a place that was more serious about the performance end of things. So I wrote to all the principal euphonium players of the military bands in DC, asking for their recommendations of who I should study with. And the name that showed up on everybody's list was Daniel Parentoni, who was then uh, the professor of tuba and euphonium at Arizona State University. And so I sent a tape off to, to Mr. P as I, as I grew to know him, and uh, he accepted me uh, on scholarship to come out to Arizona State. And so I went out there and felt very much like I had jumped into the deep end of the pool. Um, not just in terms of the level of musicianship uh, in, the, in the, the euphonium studio, but I'd never been farther west than Potsdam, New York. You know, I was from Vermont, never been on a plane before. And I hopped on a plane, flew to Arizona. I, I didn't even go out there to audition, I just sent a tape in. So my first time in Arizona was when I was there for classes. Stepped off the plane uh, on the tarmac at uh, Sky Harbor Airport in Phoenix. It's about 120 degrees, all surrounded by red rocks, you know, and I thought I was on another planet. I mean, I just thought, where, where am I, you know? Is this still the United States? <laughs> So it was really a shock to my system, but uh, it was exactly what I needed to do. Uh, Mr. Parentoni was, um, and still is, just an incredible teacher, and he was exactly who I needed at that time. Uh, I had a fair amount of technical skill at that point, but uh, he really rebuilt me as a player. Uh, my whole first semester, all he let me do was sing, buzz, and play very simple melodies because he really felt that I needed to kind of rebuild from, from the, the foundation up in terms of my concept of musicianship and, and tone production. And there were times where I thought he was never going to let me do anything other, let me do anything other than sing, buzz, and play, Roshu and, and, and Arban melodies, you know? And at one point I said, you know, Mr. P, how am I ever gonna land one of these jobs if all you ever let me do is sing, buzz, and play these simple tunes? And he said, you know, I said, how am I gonna have enough technique to land one of these jobs? And he said, Mike, you've already got more technique than you're ever gonna need. But if you don't sound good, if your basic uh, phrasing and musicianship and tone quality isn't on a high enough level, you're never gonna make it out of the prelims. And so I thought, well, I've come clear across the country to study with this guy. I should probably, you know, listen to what he says. And so I, I, I stayed with his regimen, and eventually he did let me start playing some other things. But it was the smartest decision I ever made. He really did kind of uh, reshape me as, not just as a euphonium player, but really as a musician, you know. Uh, and it, it, I, I really am um, convinced that I never would have landed one of these jobs were it not for, for his teaching. So I studied with Mr. P for a couple of years, and uh, actually it was in my third year of study when finally, I'm basically, as is often the case with performance majors, I was just waiting for an audition, you know? And finally an audition opened up, and lo and behold, it was for the Marine Band. It was the, the very band that I'd hoped to end up in one day because that first person I'd ever met all those years earlier was Lucas Spiros, right? So I showed up for the audition, and who's proctoring but Luke? So this, this guy that I had met all those years earlier was there proctoring because he was about to retire from the band. And I found out when I got there that not only was there one vacancy, but there were two. So I thought, hey, I've just increased my chances of getting a job, right? Well, guess who came in third in that audition? And 
And I thought that's that may be as close as I ever come to landing one of these jobs. And so I went back out to Arizona State to figure out, okay, so where do I go from here? And a couple months went by and I was kind of coming up with my plan B when I got a call from the Marine Band. Uh, they were letting me know that they decided to add another position to the section and wanted to know if I was still interested. And I felt like I won the lottery, you know? I mean, I just could not believe that I had actually made it into this organization. So um, I joined the band in 1987. Uh, it was a four-man section at that point. Um, and um, just loved the experience. It was everything that I hoped it was going to be. And was promoted to principal euphonium within a few years. Uh, was a, featured as a soloist on our national concert tours and in DC and was really just, you know, loving life. And I thought, there, I've arrived. I, I'm at my final destination. But I started uh, working on a master's degree in conducting at George Mason University because um, I thought if I'm ever going to land a college job, you know, post-Marine Band, I'm going to have to have some skills other than just teaching euphonium. And so I thought conducting might be a good secondary skill to have. And so uh, I was able to get into uh, the studio of Tony Maiello. He was the uh, conducting professor there. And I'd worked with Tony earlier. He was actually the wind ensemble director back at Crane, where I'd started college. And I figured Tony might take pity on me, take me into a studio, and he did. Uh, and I had a great experience learning how to become a conductor with him. But it was only with the idea of having this as a secondary skill, you know, for a college kind of environment. But when I was working on this master's degree in conducting, some of my conducting was done on the chamber series that the Marine Band organizes. Our, our players actually organize a chamber series. And so I was able to do some conducting as part of my degree program on that chamber series. And one of our assistant directors, uh, Tim Foley, pulled me aside and said, hey, we, we've been watching you on this chamber series and we kind of like what we, what we see. You know, would you be interested in, in conducting in the Marine Band? Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather because I thought, I'm a euphonium player. I'm not a conductor. I don't even know if I can make music without this hunk of metal in front of me like a shield, you know? So, um, so I had to give it a lot of thought because I really, I mean, euphonium was my passion. But I also um, had this real love of the Marine Band, you know? I'd been in the band for several years at this point. I felt like all my friends in the world were in the Marine Band and the chance to become part of the leadership team to really take care of this organization was really compelling. Uh, more so even than the conducting. The conducting part of it, I still wasn't quite sure if I had what it took. But I thought, at, at the very least, I know I love this organization, I care about these people, I really want to be part of the leadership team. And so I decided to set my euphonium down and pick up a baton. And as we jokingly say in the Marine Corps, I went over to the dark side. You know, I became a conductor and an officer and part of management in the organization. And so I was an assistant director for Colonel Foley um, for eight years. And then um, when he retired, I was appointed the director of the Marine Band. So I served as the director from 2004 to 2014. Um, after that, um, I uh, retired from the Marine Corps and, and left the band and was appointed the director of bands at Butler University in Indianapolis, Indiana, where they also let me teach euphonium. So euphonium, after 18 years of being away from my euphonium, has come back into my life, at least to some degree. I'm still primarily a conductor. I, I just, because of my travel schedule and the conducting, I don't have a chance to practice as much as I would like to. I, I don't sound nearly as good as I did once upon a time. But it's so fun to have the euphonium back in my life, to be teaching students on a regular basis, and especially to do things like this, to come to this wonderful festival and, and to hang out with euphonium and tuba players again. Oh, wow. I, I actually must have seen you conduct because I was at the inauguration of Barack Obama and. 2000 and I guess it was nine. 2009 and 2013. Yeah. I was there as a press correspondent with cameras and <laughs> yeah, I was there at that inauguration. So yeah. you probably directed I that. was conducting the Marine Band at that inauguration. So in fact, that inauguration, it was so cold that when we were supposed to start the prelude ceremony, the tubas were, were frozen up. They had sousaphones, they were out on the platform and they were frozen. And so we pre-record the entire ceremony just in case instruments freeze up and play a track if necessary. So we sent new, you know, word to the, the folks in the booth, hey, we're frozen up, we're gonna have to play a track for a while here. And uh, so the first three things that we play are uh, revolutionary era marches, very simple straight ahead marches, which are great to warm up on because they're so simple. You just get some air moving through the instruments and, and make sure you're sounding good before you start getting into the more complex stuff. And um, so those three marches we did to tape, and then the tuba players gave me the signal that their vowels were moving again, so we started playing live. Well, the first thing up was Chester, which starts with this beautiful chorale in the woodwinds, and then the chorale in the brass, and then of course you're off to the races with the allegro. 
and it's all well and good if you're already warmed up, but I thought, what is this gonna sound like, you know? Because people hadn't even had a chance to blow a note on their instruments, and we're out there in just this incredible cold, and the first notes we were playing was this chorale, and I thought, is this gonna be just so egregiously out of tune? It sounded beautiful. I mean, that's, you know, as amazing as the Marine Band can sound on the stage of Carnegie Hall or, you know, any other beautiful hall you can think of, it's the way they can sound in those kinds of environments, you know, incredibly hot temperatures or incredibly cold temperatures. And so when the woodwinds played, they sounded perfectly in tune with one, with one another. Now, I'm sure it was about 432. I'm sure it was way below 440. But they just kept listening to each other. And as, as the pitch rose, they, they kind of rose together. And the amazing thing was, you know, I talked to people who were watching at home and they said, you could not tell when the band shifted from playing to track and playing live, which I think is such a tribute to the, the musicianship and the, and really the professionalism of those musicians. Well, that's fantastic. They must, so you guys are all mic'd up for those kind of events for the TV and all that, I would yeah. guess. Like, and in fact, it's yeah. kind of funny because um, the, where the band is positioned for the inauguration, we're right next to the press pool. So we're so the platform is up here, and we're down on the level, you know, below, and the press are right next to us. And so when we started that ceremony, it looked like we were playing, but all the sound was coming out of the speakers. And the look on the, these reporters' faces were like, wait a second, what, uh, the sound's coming from there, but the musicians are there. <laughs> you know, they could not tell what was going on until, of course, we started playing live. Uh, so what's it like being in, in military life as a professional musician maybe is compared to um, civilian life as a professional musician? Um, I've kind of always wondered because there's, you know, you, you, basically, you have world-class musicians there, but there's also uh, a military camaraderie and there's also rank and order and different things. Tell me a little bit about maybe the differences if someone is to join a Marine band, say, um, in, in what it's like and the experiences you learn from the military side of things along with the music. Yeah, I mean, I think it is an existence that a lot of people in the civilian world have a hard time imagining. Um, uh, because we're wearing uniforms, you know, we have our hair cut short, we're subject to all the rules and regulations of the military. Um, they wonder how does that, you know, what kind of a bedfellow is that with, with being a musician? And it's actually much more comfortable than people might think. Um, for one thing, if you were to observe a Marine Band rehearsal, you would find that the way it was conducted is very similar to what you'd find with a symphony orchestra. We're just making music, and the relationship between the players and the conductor is very much the same as it's going to be in a civilian environment. Um, the way the rank structure works is a little different. Um, so, uh, for example, one of the challenges we have um, in a military band, especially I can, I can speak about the, the Marine Band, is that for our principal positions, we want to make sure that we've always got the best musician in those principal chairs. And that isn't always necessarily going to be the most senior person, the person with the most experience or the person with the most rank. Um, but our, our musicians understand that they want the best musicians in those chairs as well. So in some cases, you may have a section where the principal player is a staff sergeant, which is the very first rank you have coming into the band. But by virtue of the way those people play their instrument, they've earned the respect and the credibility to be musical leaders in the organization. Now that said, if we have a section, like a large section, with a very junior person as a principal player, uh, we may have a more senior person as the section leader, the person who's kind of the administrative leader for the section, who's got a lot of experience and, and management techniques you know, that, that are required. Um, but that principal player, you know, if you're a principal player in an orchestra, you automatically make principal pay, right? But if you're in a military band, you know, if you're a principal player and you're a staff sergeant, you're still making staff sergeant pay, you know? So there is a little bit of an inequity there, but what we try to make up the difference is in terms of accelerated promotion. So if you're a principal player in a, you know, of a junior rank, then you're gonna be, you know, considered for promotion more quickly than somebody else who's not sitting in one of those leadership positions. So it does require a little bit of creativity and patience in terms of trying to, you know, cram the square peg into the round hole sometimes, right? But, uh, but we find that it, it, it works more comfortably than a lot of people might imagine. And what a lot of our folks realize, because most people come into the Marine Band, they're civilians. They'll audition for the band as a, as a civilian. And if they win a position in the organization, then they are enlisted for duty for the Marine Band only, and they report for duty to, to Washington, D.C. They don't go to recruit training. So they'll spend about six weeks getting uh, military training from one of our drum majors. Um, and like I said, it's for duty only with the Marine Band. So they're coming into this Marine Corps environment from the civilian world. And I think for a lot of them, they, a lot of them, they wonder, you know, how, how's this gonna feel? And what a lot of them realize is that 
the, the standards of excellence that really kind of define the Marine Corps, that ethos and that intensity that you know you associate with a typical Marine is very much mirrored in the, the kind of dedication and ethos that we have as musicians. The hours and hours we spend in a practice room honing our craft, trying to be you know, the ultimate professional that we can be musically is very much mirrored in that ethos in the Marine Corps. And so what they realize is that this is much more comfortable and much more familiar than they might have expected when they were on the civilian side of the fence. So it is unusual, and it, you know, it, I, I don't want to suggest that it's not, but um, what I would often tell people when they'd come into the band, you know, after they'd gone through that indoctrination process and I would talk to them about their first enlistment and how sh they should approach it, I would tell them, you know, I would give it at least a year before you even allow yourself to think about whether or not you, you know, like your job because it's going to feel so unfamiliar for a long time. But once you get to that, that, that first anniversary and things start to feel familiar and this, this job and that job, you think, oh, I've done that before. That's when you start thinking, okay, do I really feel at home here? Do I feel like this is a place that I can envision staying for 20 to 30 years? And most people do end up staying. The retention rate is well over 90% of people who make a career out of their, their time in the Marine Corps. But that question you asked about, you know, uh, you know, what's it like to make music in the military? I've recently experienced it from a different perspective when I left the military to go to Butler University. And you know, when they first started considering me for this director of bands job, you know, I was coming fresh out of the Marine Corps. I, w I was still on active duty when they were interviewing me for this position. And when I went out there, to, I spent about a week on campus, um, you know, conducting the wind ensemble, of course, and they had me teach a class and, and uh, attend a faculty meeting so I could talk to the faculty. And I often jokingly tell people what they, what they were really trying to find out is if I was gonna make the kids do push-ups when they miss notes, you know, because they think Marine Corps Colonel and all they can think of is, is, is like Jack Nicholson and a few good men, you know. And so I think they were really uh, very much reassured when I came out there and worked with the musicians and found out that I really spoke the same language that they were used to hearing and that it was much more familiar than they might have expected. What's it like uh, sort of in a day -to -day base, on a day-to-day -day basis in a military band, especially the president's own, which is kind of the top one obviously in the United States, um, do musicians it, are there certain things you have to report to and then you do it, I mean, how much travel do you do? What's it just generally like being in it as far as keeping, having a family and raising a family and being in a, the military band? I don't really have any idea what the, what the Marine band does and how much you travel and how much you practice and work from day to day and week to week. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a question that we get quite a bit and it's often phrased, uh, so what is the typical day of a Marine band member like? And what I tell people is there is no typical day, you know, and that is really, um, it can be one of the most challenging parts of the job, but I always found it to be one of the most rewarding parts of the job. I, I've always been a person that really thrives on a, a variety in, in life, you know, the thought of a nine to five desk job just made my skin crawl because I just knew I wasn't wired for that. And I greatly admire people who can do that, you know? But I, I really thrive on, uh, a, on a daily schedule that's a, that's a little different every day and has a different set of challenges. And in the Marine Band, we definitely have that. So the way we're structured is we have 154 members in the organization. Of that uh, number, about 130 are actually playing musicians. The remainder are support staff. And um, so we use that that group of musicians as just a big pool of musicians. Unlike some bands in DC that have a dedicated ceremonial band, and a dedicated concert band, a dedicated jazz band, we just have a big pool of musicians and we mix and match them however we need to based on the requirements of the day, the week, the month. And so one of our uh, typical, you know, wind members, you know, might be playing on a band concert one week, an orchestra, you know, uh, event at the White House another week, uh, a brass quintet, you know, um, and then, you know, marching a, a full honors funeral in Arlington National Cemetery. So um, our philosophy is we like to spread the wealth and also share the burden. And that, that very much mirrors the, again, the ethos of the Marine Corps that, you know, uh, everyone shares in, in, in the work, you know, and so, uh, you know, from my feeling, uh, my feeling has always been that the most junior member of the band and the most senior member of the band should all be sharing equally in that work. Now, the way it's distributed may depend a little bit on your title and just, you know, where you fit in the, the overall structure, but everybody kind of shares in that. And um, our schedule varies much, varies quite a bit based on what, what season of the year we're talking about. So. 
um, from January through May. We're in DC for the most part, unless we have a special trip that we're making. And we do concerts, local concerts. And so on average, it's two, concert, two uh, band concerts a month, one orchestra concert, and one chamber music concert. And personnel are rotated, again, throughout all of those events. So you may be band or orchestra or chamber, or again, ceremonial work throughout that entire period. Once we get into the summer, then we're doing um, more like Pops concerts uh, on the mall. We do concerts at the Capitol and at the Washington Monument. Um, those are kind of hour-long, much lighter concerts. Those concerts, uh, January through May, are when we do our most serious, like heavy-duty concerts. Those are like two-hour concerts, more serious repertoire. In the summer, it's much lighter fare. Uh, in the summer, we also have more ceremonial work. Um, there are um, there's a pass and review type of ceremony that happens at Marine Barracks 8th and I every Friday night called the Friday Evening Parade. It's been going on since the 1950s, and we partake in that along with the Marine Corps uh, Drum and Bugle Corps. Um, and so that's a ceremonial event that attracts about 5,000 people a week that come in to, to view that. Uh, the, actually, I'm sorry, it's about 3,000. I don't think we could cram 5,000 into barracks, but about 3,000 people come to that um, every Friday night. And um, so we have those concerts, ceremonies, and other kind of events like that. In the fall is when we do our national concert tours, and that's when we do the bulk of our traveling. So we're on the road for about 30 days focusing on a different region uh, of the United States. That's a domestic tour that happens. Um, and we have this, the country divided up into five different re regions. So over the course of five years, we pretty much covered the entire country. And uh, those tours, while it's, you know, it's always difficult to be away from home, especially if you, have, if you have family, so they're challenging from a personal perspective, but they're very rewarding because those tour audiences are so enthusiastic. Um, in fact, just last night I was talking to Brian Bowman, who's also here at the festival and who spent many years in the Air Force Band. And we were comparing notes on uh, our, our most favorite memories from all those tours, you know, and seeing, you know, grizzled old, uh, you know, Marine Corps veterans in wheelchairs struggling to get to their feet when they hear the Marines hymn because they're so moved by this music. Uh, and so to have people literally in tears, you know, because of the music that you're providing for them is just such a gratifying experience. Um, and then, of course, you know, our primary mission is to provide music for the White House. So all the things I've described so far are events that we program and schedule ourselves. But we're always at the beck and call of the White House. So anytime, anytime the White House calls and said, we need a chamber orchestra, we need a band on the South Lawn, we need a brass quintet, we need a string quartet, we need a piano. And um, when I was director of the Marine Band, uh, my uh, main contact with the White House was uh, with the social secretary. That would be the person who would let us know what we were needed for. And, and we encouraged them whenever they had a musical need to contact us to let us know what it was and see if we could provide you know, uh, you know, support. And um, over the years that I was director, uh, I fielded requests for a mariachi band, for an Irish ensemble, for a klezmer ensemble, for a country ensemble. Um, and I'm proud to say we were able to satisfy the needs for pretty much everything they asked for. The only at that same pool of musicians. And one of the, you know, really, I think, amazing things about the musicians in the Marine Band is many of them are not only skilled on their primary instrument, but they have all sorts of secondary talents as well. For example, one of the lead singers in our country band is, one of, is a French horn player. Um, and one of the uh, members of the Irish uh, ensemble is a bassoon player who also plays penny whistle, you know? And so they have all these secondary talents that they're very generous in, you know, about sharing with, uh, with the organization, especially if they know that it's a need that the White House has, because we want to make sure that we're always doing whatever we can to support the White House. Um, so that was really one of the interesting things about you know, making music at the White House is that you never know what, what they're going to ask for. And you also never know who you're going to see. You know, I um, remember doing events at the White House. Uh, I remember one time we were doing the theme uh, from Schindler's List for a social event that was happening. And we finished playing this selection, and I hear this little smattering of applause, and I turn around, and it's John Williams and Steven Spielberg who are in the receiving line and were so flattered that we were playing their music that they came out to personally thank the orchestra. We had no idea that they could hear us that clearly. You know, we hoped they might be somewhere in the building. But, you know, to have them come out and, and personally thank us like that, you know, again, it reminds you that, yeah, you always want to make sure you're, you're sounding as good as you can sound. And there were so many other events, you know, where um, you know, we'd be playing and, you know, uh, well, I remember one event, you know, we played honors for the president who was going into the East Room. And I turned around and immediately, immediately to my left was Joshua Bell, you know, noted violin soloist. Immediately to my right was Kid Rock. 
And I thought, where else but the White House where you can have Kid Rock and Joshua Bell together at the same event, right? But other events where I, I turn around and suddenly I see that it's Van Cliburn, you know, who's just hanging around near the orchestra because he's enjoying the music, you know? So it was uh, really uh, exciting to go to the White House. You know, was, you know, I've been to the White House hundreds of times to make music there. Every single time I went there, I had butterflies in my stomach because it was just that you never knew what was going to happen. Do the Marine Band from time to time have professionals like Yo-Yo Ma come in and do concerts with the Marine Band, or is it usually just from that pool? Um, well, I mean, so those White House encounters were very much kind of uh, uh, not luck of the draw, but you just never knew who you were going to run into there. But we certainly have had guest artists. You know, the one that I'm, I'm most proud of is John Williams, with whom we've worked several times. Um, and this relationship started back when I was an assistant director for Colonel Tim Foley. And we were coming up on a big anniversary concert at the Kennedy Center, trying to think of some way to really mark this anniversary. It was our 205th anniversary in, in 2003. And so I suggested to Colonel Foley, well, maybe we could get John Williams to you know, conduct a band. And he's like, well, good luck, Mike, because he's never conducted a band as far as I know. And so I thought, well, what the heck? You know, so I sat down and wrote a letter. Well, I typed a letter, I didn't handwrite it, but, um, and sent it off, you know, and several months went by, and I, frankly, I'd forgotten that I'd even sent this letter. And uh, I got a, a message on the phone um, that turned out to be from uh, John Williams' agency. And uh, I talked to the person who represents him, and he said, Mr. Williams, get your letter. He's incredibly flattered, and he would love to conduct the band, so let's work this out. And so it was very gratifying for me to be able to go into Colonel Foley's office and say, guess what I just found out, you know? And, uh, and we worked with him actually several times. It was the beginning of a long relationship that continues to this day, actually. Um, he conducted us in 2003, and then he came back again in 2008 for our 210th anniversary. And uh, for both of those events, he um, commissioned the arrangements and transcriptions of several of his works. Uh, he is represented by Hal Leonard, so several of their best transcribers, including um, Paul Lavender and Jay Bocook, and our own staff arranger, Steve Bulla, did transcriptions under his supervision of m many of his most beloved works, the film works, you know, Star Wars and Jurassic Park and, and all the, the Olympic themes and all that kind of stuff. Uh, those were all arranged for those concerts, you know, so because of that relationship, the band world has so many uh, more transcriptions of John Williams' music than we might have otherwise had, you know, which I think is, makes us feel good. It makes us feel like we're helping to contribute to our repertoire, you know? And then in, uh, for our 215th anniversary, he was supposed to come back again, but unfortunately, that was the year of sequestration. I don't know if you remember that, but it's when um, the budget for the military was essentially frozen. We had our tours canceled, uh, this concert was canceled at the Kennedy Center, but um, the consolation prize we got out of that was uh, for, that, for that third time, I had finally convinced Mr. Williams to write a piece specifically for the Marine Band. So those, for those other events, he thought about it, but he just didn't have time because we all know how incredibly busy he is. But for that 250th anniversary, he agreed to write us a selection. And then when the concert was canceled, you know, and I had to call and let him know this, and I said, you know, John, I'm so sorry because I know you were going to write the work. He said, well, I'm going to write that anyway. So he went ahead and wrote us uh, a fanfare he called For the President's Own, uh, very kind of prosaically titled, you know. Um, and then he happened to be coming to D.C. to conduct a Capitol Fourth um, with the National Symphony Orchestra. And so as part of that trip, he came to Marine Barracks and rehearsed and recorded that work with the Marine Band. So you can find that video, in fact, uh, on YouTube. Um, but what an incredibly generous and kind man. I mean, he is just one of the, the, the uh, most wonderful people I've ever met, you know. And, 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 and for somebody so successful, I mean, he's at the very top of his craft, right? And you think he might be a little full of himself, a little egocentric. No, he's just the kindest person. Yeah, it's so refreshing. So, um, so in the Marine Band, you obviously are wearing uniforms and there's a uniformity of that. Is there the same thing in the instruments? I've always kind of wondered, like, do the tuba players always all play on the same instrument? Do the euphonium players play on the same brand of instrument? Or is there a special way? Or can you pick your own instrument as an individual? Yeah, and various... Uh, points in the band's history, we have had sections that have all played the same instrument. For example, uh, for many years, all of our trumpet players, uh, when they were playing cornet parts, they played them on this special instrument that was developed by Vincent Bach Corporation specifically for the Marine Band, which was essentially a hybrid between a trumpet and a cornet. 
Um, we've moved away from that in recent years. Uh, the philosophy now is that we want to make sure we have a unified sound, but we're not going to actually prescribe the instrument. Uh, we really leave it up to the players and the principal players to make sure that everyone is really kind of on board and playing with the same kind of sound concept. And, and that honestly is one of the things that I think uh, I'm most proud of with the Marine Band and that I, I really tried to help kind of uh, encourage and, and advance during my time as director is this sense of the band functioning as a large chamber ensemble. Um, I think in part because I came from within the band. I played euphonium in the band for nine years. And so when I came onto the podium, these people were not, I didn't feel like they were playing for me. I felt like they were playing with me, you know, that I was really, I just had a slightly different role, but in many ways I was kind of like the chief collaborator in a large chamber ensemble. And so with my conducting students to this day, I really encourage them to take that approach that, you know, of course, as the conductor, you need to have a clear vision of how, exactly how you want this music to go. You're responsible for the interpretation, but you don't want to be so ironclad, you know, so locked into that, that, that interpretation that you're not willing to, to hear what the band members have to offer themselves. You know, I can't tell you how many times I went into a rehearsal thinking I knew exactly how I wanted a piece to go. And then I would hear how our, our principal cornet player played a certain phrase or our principal clarinet player uh, phrased something. And I thought, you know, I, th I thought I, want, I knew exactly how I wanted this to go, but I like that better, you know? And because they knew that I was open to this kind of interchange of ideas, they were willing to take more chances and really felt more like, I think, stakeholders in the process. Um, and they also knew that I had ultimate trust in their ability to fix problems on their own. So there are many times in a rehearsal where there might be a little pitch problem or a stylistic issue, and oftentimes I would just start to say something and they would already be nodding like, yep, we got this, don't worry about it, you know? And that is so uh, reassuring to a conductor to know that you're not responsible for every little thing that happens on that stage, but that I can trust our principal players you know, and, and people within the section to adjust and, and make those things happen the way that they needed to happen. Um, and that um, there really was kind of a hierarchy. So, you know, I envision our kind of flow chart, if you will, is kind of coming from that principal cornet as the senior brass and the principal clarinet as the senior woodwind. And everyone is listening to those two players in particular. And the woodwinds are really gravitating toward the clarinet and the brass toward the cornet. And that there is kind of a, a trickle down effect that everyone you know, within the section is listening to their principal and the principals are listening to each other, but with special attention to that, that key, it's almost like the concert master in, a, in an orchestra, right? You know, the, the, the musicians get a lot of their direction from that concert master that doesn't, doesn't necessarily have to come strictly from the podium. And so that's very much what happens in the Marine Band, and it's, I think, a big reason why we have such an identifiable sound, because there is this cohesiveness. And it's not that it's, uh, you know, like, this is the, you, you shall play like this. It's not like dictated like that, but it's this collective interest in having a cohesive musical message that I think really helps to define the organization. Now, we're, we're here at the, uh, the IET, and you're meeting all these young euphonium players and tubists and all that. How do you think it's different now than when you were trying to get into a military band as a euphonium player? A lot of these players, I've met a lot of these young players and they're interested, they, they would love to do music as a career and um, I mean, my guess is there are probably even less euphonium gigs than tuba gigs, I'm not really sure, but there's few for both, right? Uh, so how do you think it's different these days, or is it is it any different? What would you say to a to a young euphonium player about who really wants to be a professional these days about how they could, you know, go about doing that kind of thing if they're interested in that? Yeah, I, I do think it's probably more difficult these days than it's ever been to land one of those jobs because the level of playing just keeps getting better and better. I mean, there were plenty of really fine euphonium players when I was coming up. Um, I had many good friends who I felt like you know, they were just as talented, if not more talented than I was. And so, I mean, yes, you have to play well. Yes, you have to win that audition. But there's a certain amount of luck, for lack of a better word, you know, um, or, or, you know, A, having a good day playing, B, having a, a, a tone quality and a stylistic approach that really kind of resonates with the, with the ensemble that you're auditioning for. So there are a number of factors that really make it a challenge to win any job. But um, the, the number of really talented players, you know, when I hear, you know, uh, 
high school players who seem to play as well as some college players that I remember from my day, you know? It makes me realize that our, uh, our profession has really advanced. Um, just the number of instruments that are available. I was talking to some of the young euphony players earlier today about, you know, when I was coming up, it was pretty much the Wilson and the Hurstbrunner that were the two instruments that everybody was, was choosing from. And now there are easily a, a dozen professional model euphoniums on the market, you know, all of which are, you know, built, constructed at a very high level. So, um, so I think our profession really has advanced. There's so much more music being written for, you know, euphonium and tuba now. Um, stuff, you know, of course, continues to be arranged, but a lot of wonderful original compositions. When I was coming up, there were a handful of concertos, you know, that, that you could play. Now there are scores of concerti, you know, both for band and orchestra that, that you might choose from. Um, so I'd say the competition is stiffer than it's ever been, but still the fact that remains that somebody has to win those jobs, you know, that it is possible with enough hard work, enough dedication, a passion for music. I mean, you've got to have that too. And then at the end of the day, you could have some luck. I mean, as I as I told you, you know, earlier in the interview, you know, I came in third when they were looking for two, you know, and I thought I didn't have the luck, and I I was just very fortunate that they decided to add a position a few months later and, and called me up. So I've never lost sight of the fact. I never, you know, uh, thought uh, yes, I was I was one of the great euphonium players. That's why I get the job. I, there's there's a yes, I worked hard. Yes, I had a certain amount of talent but there's a certain amount of good fortune involved too. So I've never taken that for granted. And for young players today, you know, the, the advice I give them is pretty much the same as I would have given 25, 30 years ago. You've got to find a good teacher, a teacher that you really click with. You know, I mentioned earlier in this interview that Mr. Parentoni was exactly the teacher that I needed at that point in my development. And that's one of the keys, is finding the right teacher that can not just identify what you need to fix, but is able to teach in a way that really works with you, that, that, you, can, that you can understand and appreciate and, and that it's very effective as far as your learning style is concerned. Um, and that you take advantage of every opportunity for professional growth, you know, attending things like the IET, hearing as many euphonium players as you can, taking lessons with different teachers. I mean, I think um, the idea of just finding one teacher and then just locking yourself into that teacher, I think is, is kind of short-sighted. You know, I think it's really wise to study with as many different people as you can. Even if they're saying similar things, they may say it in a slightly different way that suddenly you have that eureka moment, right? And so I think it's really, that's one of the things I really admire about what Adam has done with this festival is the, the plethora of learning opportunities, the chance to take private lessons, to play in master classes, to just hang out with these people, you know, and to hear them play in person, ask them questions, you know. I, I really admire the fact that so many of the faculty here are accessible, you know. They want, they want kids to come up and ask them questions and, and to talk shop. But I think that really is, is the key, is that you've got to, you know, if you want one of those jobs, you've just got to throw everything that you've got into it and look for every opportunity to become the best musician that you can. And of course, it extends beyond the euphonium or the tuba as well. I mean, in my lessons, you know, when I'm talking to students about developing a vibrato, you know, tone quality, I encourage them to study not just euphonium players, but study vocalists, study string players, you know, listen to how they use vibrato because I think that in some ways can be even more illuminating than listened, listening to how other brass players use vibrato. So it's really opening yourself up to as many uh, learning opportunities as possible. Um, I think that really is the key. And of course it doesn't end when you land that job, you know, I mean that's just the next step in the process, but then you continue to try to improve as much as you can as a musician. Tell me a little bit more about this particular festival and why do you think it's unique maybe compared to some other festivals you may have been to in the past? Yeah, well, for some of the reasons that I've already talked about, you know, the fact that you can take so many different private lessons, um, that, um, that, you know, you have these opportunities to take master classes, to play in chamber ensembles that are coached, again, by faculty members. Um, there are just so many different ways you can access the, the wisdom and the knowledge and instruction of these people. And the fact that it's not the same group of people every year, that Adam does a great job of mixing it up and he has different people that he brings in. Some people are, are constants, but there are other variables. And some are here for the whole week and some are here for just a couple of days. Uh, but there are so many opportunities to learn from these people. And not just in the lesson, you know, not just 
um, in the master class. Sometimes the, the greatest wisdom happens at the at the reception after the concert. You know, when you're you're breaking bread together at dinner. You know, um, those casual conversations, what those can lead to, and that. And many of these relationships, of course, they begin here at IET, but then they're continued through Facebook, through email, through Skype lessons, through any number of other opportunities to continue to learn from people. Uh, but it really, you know, as is the case with so many professions um, in the world, so much of it comes down to relationships. It's getting to know people and, and to develop those friendships, you know, professional and personal friendships and uh, never knowing where those are going to lead and when they're going to come in handy and when they're going to um, help you to develop not only as a musician but really as a person, you know. Um, it's that personal side of our music business that I love to see so emphasized here at IET. Um, there are so many, not just musical opportunities, but social opportunities. And like I said, the, the, the learning can happen anywhere. You never know when you're going to come across that nugget of information that is revelatory, you know, and you do have that kind of epiphanal moment. How do you think technology and social media is changing music education in general, just amongst students and just amongst anyone in the world having, you know, access to seeing like Chris Olka and different people going on the internet and literally teaching, say, on YouTube and right. that sort of thing. What do, you, what do you think about that big, ch I mean, it's kind of an interesting change, I think. And it is. I mean, it's, um, it's affecting uh, music making and music instruction on virtually every level. Uh, you know, at Butler University, we're constantly looking for ways that we can augment what we can offer to students by using technology, by using social media. Um, and the, the, the upside is really endless, you know, uh, in terms of um, how we can disseminate this information to the greatest number of people. Um, and tap into this in a way that it, it can be passive. You can just be viewing something, you know, a lesson or a master class that's already happened. It could be recorded. Or it can be in real time. You could have, you know, real interaction back and forth, you know, through, you know, Skype types of technology. The downside is that there's a lot of noise. You know, there are so many opportunities out there and, and trying to, uh, to get the word out about those, being, being able to access those can be a little challenging. So, I, and I think there will be ways that, um, that we've yet to even discover in terms of cataloging this information and being able to access it. But I think it's a very exciting time, I really do. And, um, and I think we're, we're, we're really just entering this frontier, you know. I don't, I don't think we really yet can grasp all the things that we're going to be able to do as we catch up to technology, if we ever can. Do you think that because of the technology and the kids growing up, I mean, I know with my kids, you know, where there's a balance you have to play with keeping them away from these devices and the different things. Um, I, I see attention spans being so different now than, than they were in the past. I mean, I'm a Gen Xer, but, you know, do you think that that's affecting the way people are viewing music? Are less people coming out to see live music? And um, what do you see as live, the future of, of live classical music, whether it be band and orchestra, in competition with the fact that there's so much that someone can get in their own pocket with their headphones, if you know what I mean? Right. You know? Yeah, and again, this gets back to what I was saying before about uh, there's so much noise out there that uh, it, it's hard to um, kind of separate yourself from that and to really stand out. Um, you know, I've been hearing about the demise of classical music, I feel like, since I was a young man, you know, and, uh, and I'm not saying that we're not facing some real threats and some challenges. But I think it will continue to exist in, in some shape or form in perpetuity, really. Um, but I think there's a danger, you know, I, I, I remember, you know, I kind of came of age in the, in the 80s, you know, which was in many ways kind of the heyday of the professional orchestras with the number of services and the salaries and the benefits. And, and there was a feeling uh, at the, that I sensed at the time that this is the way it should be and shall ever be, you know? And what I think people have lost sight of is that that really hadn't been the case for more than a couple of decades. And the way that the whole professional orchestral world was constructed was not based on the demand of society, but it was based on the expectations of the musicians themselves, the expectations and the hopes. And so there is kind of a Darwinian aspect to this that 
can make everyone a little uncomfortable, you know? Um, but my feeling is we'll work our way through this. It's just going to take a while. It's going to take some creativity. You know, I'm often talking to my students at Butler, you know, who are getting ready to have a life in music. And, um, and I encourage them to be as creative and entrepreneurial in their approach to this as they can be. Even as a music educator, you know, there was a time when I was a, a young man, the feeling was, well, if you get a music ed degree, you could get a teaching job at a school with benefits and they would take care of you and you'd be there for your whole career. And even teaching jobs are really changing and in some ways kind of regressing. Some of those teaching models are more like what was happening in the 50s and 60s when music education was really just getting you know, established you know, across the country. And I still think it's gonna be possible and lucrative and attractive to have a life in music, but it's gonna require a little more creativity, a little more personal responsibility to carve out that career. Um, it's going to be possible, but you're going to have to really work at it. You know, and there's no greater example. My gosh, Adam Fry, what that guy does. I mean, I wonder, does he ever sleep? You know, I mean, because uh, he's just got so many different things going and has been so creative and entrepreneurial from the very outset of his career. And he has demonstrated, you know, I mean, I'm sure there were many people who told him, well, you can't have a career as a a euphonium soloist, that's impossible, you know? Well, he's proved them wrong, you know? And he's had to kind of stitch together some other things to help support that. But in many ways, he is, I think, kind of the archetype of the entrepreneurial musician for the future, finding ways to, um, to create a product that people do want, even if they don't know that they want it yet, you know? But like this very festival, there really wasn't a model for anything quite like this. But he sensed what the need was, what, where there would be an appetite for, for this kind of instruction. And, and made it so, you know, it's kind of his euphonium field of dreams, you know, he built it and they have come. And I think it really is a, is a tremendous model, not just for euphonium and tuba players, but for anyone who really wants to have a life in music in a way that hasn't necessarily even been invented yet. So I think that's, it's gonna require that kind of creativity and energy to, to move forward.